We are in our lesson series here at the Prairie Center Church of God of Prophecy in Olathe, Kansas on the letters or the letter to the Ephesians. Just as a reminder, this was a letter written by the Apostle Paul, uh, the, the same Apostle Paul that we are studying in our Wednesday night Bible study, uh, Brother Rick Newson is doing. And so that's a, a good lesson, a lot of in-depth stuff there on the Apostle Paul. Uh, but Paul was writing this from prison. So, you know, when you think about all the, the pleasantries that he's talking about here and the joy and the peace and all of these things that he is uh, going to describe in today's lesson, uh, we, we have to understand that he's writing this from prison and under the oppression of the enemy. And so uh, when we think of how bad we have things in our life, sometimes we ought to use that for perspective that, uh, you know, we, we have uh, a lot better life than we sometimes deserve, as, as Dave Ramsey says, but uh, we do, in spite of anything that's going on, we always have the hope of Jesus Christ and the, the assurance of his forgiveness in our life. Our lesson Golden Text is Ephesians 2 and 8. It says, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Who doesn't like to get gifts? Don't we like to get gifts? You know, even as an adult, you know, we, we, we hedge things. We say, oh, I don't really need anything. But, but if somebody gives us a gift, we, we really like it, you know, most of the time. Unless they give us a gift that, that is something that they like and we don't like. That's the kind of gifts I get. But, but no, we, we do enjoy getting gifts. But the ultimate gift, of course, is the gift of forgiveness, the gift of eternal life that God has offered offered us through Jesus Christ. And that is how uh, we want to think about today's lesson. The subtitle, or the title of the lesson, A New Life in Christ. Salvation by grace unites all believers in Christ. So today we're going to uh, be in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to do the whole chapter today. Uh, but it's got a lot of really neat things in it. And, and so that's... Uh, where we'll start in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins okay so the 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 he who's the he that he's talking about of course if we go back to chapter 1 he is describing Jesus Christ and how um, the the work that Christ has done in our lives and what he has has uh, the authority that he has he has put all authority under his feet that he is above all and he is all powerful and and so we transition from that thought process right into the word and uh, the, the two of the, the the best words in the Bible uh, and we'll talk about both of them today the word and and the word but uh, and so today we're saying and uh, uh, Jesus has quickened us and, and to be quickened it's a, a terminology that we don't use a lot but it means to to bring to life you know it's uh, uh, the the uh, the the quickening uh, you're a lot quicker when you're alive than when you're dead right you know if you if somebody tries to, to to poke at you if you're alive you can move out of the way if you're dead you, you just you don't you don't move so we are the quickening the the bringing to life that we have um, and how were we dead or why were we dead it's it's a, a two prong thing here it's both a spiritual death and a physical death that we experience we are dead in our trespasses and sins that that um, why well you can say well you know even as a youngster you said well I didn't I didn't really do anything bad but because of the nature of sin and and because that through Adam sin was brought into this world we all understand that 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 our humanity is our sin you know and that seems harsh but that's the, the that's the the evil of sin sin is a harsh master and and sin was brought into this world through Adam and because of our humanness we are uh, dead spiritually we are separated from the life of, of uh, God and the relationship of God by the sin that's in our past uh, or because of who we uh, are as humans. In verse 2 it goes on, it says, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Uh, we're talking about the, the walk, the walk. It says you in times past 
He, he's talking to a church body here, of course, we know. He is talking to a group of Christians, and he says, even you, um, and I can point to you because in last week's lesson we understood that he was not only writing this to the church at Ephesus, but he was writing this to all the saints. That includes us. If we're saints of God, he is writing this to us, and this information is valid even now. So he says, in the past, you walked according to the course of the world. The pathway that you chose. You know, we, we talk a lot about pathways. We have, you know, career paths. We have a direction in our life that we're seeking. We have a chosen path path that we've decided to go down. And so, so, you know, the way that you walk, the direction that you walk, how you walk, uh, is what it's talking about here. Now, just as a, as a little uh, side note, the way somebody walks, you can tell a lot about a person, can't you? You can tell, you know, when a, when a teenager comes in the room, you can tell if they're sad you know, you can tell if they're angry, you can tell if they're excited, and I, I use teenagers. We're, we all will express our emotions in the way that we walk, okay? Um, I learned as a small child, um, as I was growing up, that, that you're, you're supposed to pick up your feet when you walk. Okay, I was instructed uh, of that frequently by a size 10 and a half D red wing slip on work boot. <laughs> that would come up with a slight 45 degree angle and catch you right in the lower part of your hips, shall we say. And the, 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 the instruction was, pick up your feet, pick up your feet. Yeah, you'd be scuffing along in the dirt or you'd be scuffing along here and there. And, and at the time, it, it didn't mean a lot to me. But as I grew older, I recognized that that instruction was more than just um, pick up your feet. It's walk with a sense of purpose. You know, when, when you're walking, when you're going someplace, do it with a sense of purpose. Do it with um, um, uh, uh, just, just an intention in your heart of what you're doing. You're not just, you know, wandering around. You can tell when people are just, they're kind of lost. You know, you, uh, like me, when I go into the big city, you're, you're walking around like this. Yeah, that's the first sign of a tourist. You know, when you're, when you're lost, you're looking around, you're in awe of what's going on. You're not paying attention to what's going on around you. The walk that we are um, on as a Christian is, uh, should be very much filled with purpose, and it should be very much filled with direction. Because you are going to follow a path. You are either going to follow the path of righteousness or the, the, the easier path that is described so many times in the scripture, the, the pathway to destruction, which is, is filled with self-love, um, it's filled with self-satisfaction, it's so, uh, uh, full of pride, and all of those kind of things. So the pathway, the walk that we do uh, previously was according to the prince of the power of the air. And that's a, a description of Satan. Uh, there is a real Satan. There is a real entity that is um, trying to guide us towards the destruction that is coming his way, that he wants us to join. It says, among who, the, the, he's talking again about this group of people that we used to be in, that were following after Satan, and we were the children of disobedience. We were under his instruction as young, um, as young children of disobedience. It says, among whom also we had all our conversation conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. He says, don't fool yourself, you, you, you church at Ephesus. You were just like that one time. You fulfilled your own earthly lust, your physical lust, your pride, uh, everything that made you feel good. That's what you followed after. But that was before. That's how you, your conversation is another word for your whole behavior was as if you wanted to please yourself. And now we come to that second uh, word that's, uh, that uh, we talk about every once in a while that's one of my favorite phrases. Uh, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 it, it starts off, but God. Okay. I just for fun I, I uh, searched that phrase in my Bible uh, computer, okay? And it, it's amazing how many times that appears. It didn't give me an actual count. I didn't have time to, to do the count, but the, the number of times when 
there was a tragedy happening or there was something, uh, some oppression happening or this was happening or that was happening, but, it's, uh, but the, the interjection there was, but God, but God saved them, but God supplied their needs, but God did this, but God did that. And so here it describes us as living a life that is self-satisfying, uh, in a pathway that leads to destruction that is following the, the, uh, the course that Satan has set before us. But he says, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sin hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. He says, but God, even when you were dead in sin, even when you were at your worst, God still loved you and he sent Jesus Christ to die for you and 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 so God who is rich in mercy he has an abundance to be rich in something means you don't lack for it okay he is rich in mercy he offers it freely uh, to us and he says and he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus uh, verse 7 goes on uh, describing that, says that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. He says that, that this salvation that he offers through the mercy that he freely gives us, he's going to, uh, we are going to be able to live, he says we're going to live together or sit together in heavenly places in or through or because of Christ Jesus. The, the sitting with him, you know, the, as, as we studied a, a few weeks ago, the, the, the revelation and the, the power and authority of Jesus as he sits on this throne, but he will welcome us to that heavenly place with him. We are going to sit with him. We are going to, to uh, realize the same riches and blessings that he has because of this unity that, that Christ has uh, called us to. And, and, and the riches that he has shown us. Verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that, and that, that salvation, is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You know, it's important that we define um, what this uh, is describing here, that when it talks about that we are uh, saved by grace, through our faith. There's nothing, and, and we'll get into that a little bit more as we go along, but, but grace we know is, an, a, a common de description or definition of that is unmerited favor. It says that there's nothing that we've done or can do to deserve it. There's nothing that we can say, there's nothing we can do, there's no amount of money that we can pay, there's nothing that we can do to earn our forgiveness and our salvation, but it's by faith. Faith in what? And what is faith? I mean, you have to define that as well. You know, faith is believing in something uh, that, that you have some evidence for, you know, but you really can't see or you can't prove. I mean, you know, I can't prove to you that there is a God. Okay, I, I have to take that on faith. Now, I can see the evidence of God in my life. I can see the things that he has done for me. Um, you know, we've talked over the, the, a few weeks ago when we talked about the creation of, of this earth that, that God tells us that he reveals himself in creation. So if we look for him, we will find him and he will show himself to us. But I can't prove it to you. I can't prove that there uh, was a man named Jesus. I mean, historically there is evidence of that, but I can't prove who he was and what the, the, um, the entirety of his godliness the, the, the suffering that he did, his resurrection, I can't prove those things to you, but I can believe him in faith through the spirit that moves in me and through, through the, the direction. When, when the Holy Spirit moves on us and prompts us that we are uh, convicted as sinners under the, uh, uh, the, the way he, uh, the, the walk that we had previously been uh, doing, our previous actions, we know that we are sinners, and we know that, that, uh, that, that through the anointing of the Holy Spirit that there is a faithful God, and we have the faith that he has forgiven us. So that's, uh, it is uh, something for us. Verse 9 continues, or, or the, the last part of 8, it says, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's, again, nothing that you can do to earn it. 
Now, that's where we have to, to make sure that we are paying attention to um, uh, what the scripture tells us here. Uh, there, there is going to be a responsibility for us as Christians once we receive that grace, once we receive that gift. If you give somebody a gift, okay, you, you know, you, you, you have somebody that is, uh, um, oh, let's just pick some, some hobby out of the, the air. You know, they, they love to, uh, to, to do woodworking, okay? And so you give them a brand new set of tools that, that would use for woodworking, okay? And, and all of a sudden, you know, they come uh, to, to an, an event and that tool is still in the box. They haven't used it yet, okay? They, they, they have, you know, they're taken out. It's like me when I'm trying to do finished carpentry work uh, with a roofing hatchet. It just, it, it, it didn't turn out real well, okay? Um, and so I wasn't using the proper tool. If somebody had given me the proper tool and I didn't use it, then they would, they would feel uh, frustrated with me, shall we say, okay? So the, God has given us a gift this gift of salvation, he freely gives it to us, but there is a responsibility for it. We can't earn it by our works, um, but, but there is a purpose for what he has given us. In verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that, sh that we should walk in them. He says, you know what, we, you know, in the previous chapter we talked about this, this predestined uh, plan that God had for salvation, uh, a plan for the church body, a plan for the Christians to unite and, and do this work of God. He says that was all uh, in God's plan from the very beginning. And when he saves us, he says he has created us for a good work. And so if you, you, you look around and you say, I just, I have no purpose in my life. Well, then you're not paying attention to what the scripture says. I hate to break it to you like that. Okay. Your purpose may not be what fulfills your flesh, fleshly desires. Your purpose may not be what gets your name in the, in the uh, newspaper on, on the good side of the page instead of the bad side of the page. Uh, your your um, purpose may not be what uh, other people see as beneficial, but God made you with a purpose. God put you in a specific place at a specific time that when you come to know him, he has a purpose for you. Okay? And whether anybody else recognizes that purpose, whether anybody else um, benefits, of course we know that, that in the works that we do for God, somebody will benefit because God says that everything works together for, for good, okay? That everything is going to work together, but we may not get any recognition here on this earth for the, the works that we do. Okay? And the works, as it stated earlier, the works are not what save you. You're not to boast about your works. But when you are in a relationship with God, we come to the realization that God created us unto or for the purpose of good works. So that, that the works that we do will reveal our godly nature. Okay? It's going to reveal that. And so uh, keep that in mind. Don't ever think that, that uh, number one, don't ever think that you're not loved. Because the scriptures clearly tell us that God loves us. And that he gave us that gift because he loved us. And secondly, don't ever think that God doesn't have a plan for you. God doesn't have a purpose for you. Uh, that because God does have a purpose for you. Uh, because it says so right here. He says that we are to walk in a, in a way that he has ordained uh, for us. And because of that, in verse 11, it says, Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by them which are called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Well, that sounds like a terrible place to be, doesn't it? Um, he, he's shifting gears here a little bit, the Apostle Paul is. He was writing to us and he's telling us that, that uh, we are saved by grace, that we are um, uh, uh, in this body of believers based on the, uh, the, the gift of God that he has given us. And now he switches gears and he's going to describe this body of Christ a little more clearly to us. He's writing this 
to a church body, just as if he were writing it to our church body, or if he was writing it to the universal church. All saints, he says, every saint in the world should uh, hear this word and should apply it to their lives. So he says, there was a time, you know, if you think about this church at Ephesus, this was a, a, a church that was uh, mostly Gentile believers. But he says there was a time when the uncircumcised, which would have been represented of the Gentiles, uh, they were separated from God because God had, as the Old Testament shows us, God had his chosen people, the, the, the Jewish, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, and circumcision was their uh, symbolic purification. That's how they were identified as God's people was through this, this process of circumcision. And we know there were lots of other customs and lots of other laws that they had to abide by in order to, to be considered holy according to the law. But the, the Gentiles were completely separated from that. They were not allowed to uh, uh, worship in the same fashion as the Israelites. There was a, even in business, there was a separation. There was a, uh, a segregation of the two uh, different groups. You were either a Jew or a Gentile. Uh, there, there was nothing in between. And so uh, that's where everything was up until this point. He says, and that's what Paul is saying. He says, remember, you were in this situation where you were separated from God. You had no hope. The Jews talked about a Messiah. The Jews talked about a hope in God. The Gentiles up to that point had no hope. They had no, no uh, uh, Messiah that was coming for them. But um, verse 13 starts off that same way. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. He says at one point you were separated. You had no hope of being uh, in this promise. But he says now you that were far off, you Gentiles that had no hope, you're brought near or brought nigh. You were brought near how? By the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, it would be easy for the Jewish culture to say, and, and there was uh, evidence of that as in some of the other um, uh, scriptures here in the New Testament that Paul had to address, that it would be easy for the Jewish um, uh, groups within the church body to say, you need to be circumcised to be a Christian. You need to do this part of the law. You need to do that part. And, and, and Paul is reminding them here, those of you who are Gentiles, you are made part of this body through the blood of Jesus Christ. There's no action that you need to take other than the faith in Jesus Christ. And that's true for us today as well. There's no action that we need to do. Um, you know, the, the, there will be changes. We are going to be, as the uh, title of this lesson said, we will have a new life. We will have a new path, a new purpose once we become a Christian. But there's nothing that we have to do in order to start that process, to receive that forgiveness. Um, it says, uh, verse 14, it says, for he is our peace. Uh, peace is the opposite of, of, uh, of war. Okay. Uh, the, when you have, uh, 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 conflict, there is agitation between two parties. You know, the, it may be verbal, it may be physical, it may be emotional, uh, whatever the reason is, there is a, if there's an animosity or an enmity, uh, between two groups of, of people or two entities, uh, it creates conflict, it creates uh, uh, pain and suffering, all of these things that are associated with that. When you bring peace, what does that bring? That brings a sense of calm. The, you know, the, 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 when Christ told the, the sea to, 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 to said, peace be still. There, it was just, it was, there was a calm, there was a comfort, there was a, a, a serenity associated with that. He says, but, uh, but he, Christ, he's our peace. There was um, uh, uh, an angst between God. There was a break in that relationship that came from, the, from Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden. And that separation, that war, that battling between God and us, he says, Christ is our peace. He says, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And so not only is he talking about the relationship with God, but he's talking about the relationship with people. Okay. Um, as you can imagine, this, this centuries long, generations long separation between the Jews and the Gentiles uh, was hard to overcome for, for the people of that time. 
uh, I, I say people of that time, there's still some, some uh, issues with that today, isn't there? Um, and it doesn't have to be between the Jews and the Gentiles. It can be between any two people groups, okay? There is a natural animosity that Satan loves to antagonize between people groups, whether it's based on ethnicity or language or, or um, uh, social economic uh, status. Whatever the circumstances are, if there's a difference between people, we're going to find it and we're going to point it out and we're going to emphasize it. Okay? And in and, and, and the New Testament here, Paul is saying there are two distinct groups of people here that, that went as far as having a wall. In the, in the old temple, uh, there was a wall that was built to secure the inner court. The Gentiles that wanted to worship God could only be on the, the, the periphery. They could only be on the edges. They couldn't come in to the main part of the temple to worship. And, and they would have signs. They've got, you know, ar archaeological uh, uh, signs that were, you know, you know, if you're not holy, and, and in their mind, holy was the, the holy ones of God, the chosen ones of God. If you're not the holy ones, you can't come in to participate fully in God's presence. And, and Paul is telling them here, Christ took all that down. There's no separation. There's nothing that would separate any people group, whether they're Jew or Gentile, whether they speak English or not, whether they're, they're black or white or, or rich or poor. No matter what the circumstances, there's nothing that separates us from, number one, the love of God, but also, number two, the unity that we should feel as the family of God. Okay? So, so if anybody is trying to put a separation in there, in, in your life and in your culture, it's not coming from God. Because it, as Christians, we are to have fellowship one with another. We're to have unity one with another. And that's, that's what uh, Paul said. It's because of Christ. Because he is our peace. Christ can bring us a peace in those circumstances where there would not naturally be peace. It's, it's unnatural uh, for us to have peace with people that are different than us. But through Christ, we can have that peace and we can have that unity. Um, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to, uh, for to make in himself of twain or two different ones, he made one new man so making peace. Uh, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Okay? So you can say all you want to that, that uh, I have a right to, to, to my opinion and, and this, this people or this people group or this, this, this anything, fill in the blank, um, shouldn't be here or shouldn't be there. But, uh, but uh, Paul is saying... Christ himself, he says, he took that on himself, and he took everything that separated us. The, the, he's talking specifically here about the Jews and the Gentiles, but we can insert any group into that. He says he took those two groups that were, that were distinctly separated, and he put them together and made one. He made one thing out of them because God himself through the, the, the uh, he has destroyed that enmity. And come, in verse 17, and come and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. He says, so that this message, this gospel message is for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles, it's for everyone. Nobody is excluded from the message uh, th this preaching, this message of peace, this message of forgiveness, this message of grace that God has for us. It's for everybody uh, in every uh, situation. It says, for through him we, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. You mean I serve the same God as the people on the other side of the world? The people that have a different skin color or have different clothes, okay, that, that don't wear jeans or that, that uh, 
you know, you fill in the blank in any different category. We have one God that has, uh, through the, by the Spirit, which says we both have access. He's again talking about those groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. He says there's no difference. The Jews could not elevate themselves above the Christians. The Christians, uh, uh, you know, once, once the, 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 the Jewish people that became Christians and the Gentiles that became Christians, he says now there's no difference between you. You are the same. You are unified in God through the Spirit. And that's, that's a, a huge blessing for us, that, that it is through his sacrifice that he made. It says, and so what do we do about it? What are you going to do about it? Now, you know, you've got the information. What do you do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, verse 19, it says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You are now fellow citizens. Uh, in school they used to teach citizenship. Okay? I don't know if they do that anymore. Or, uh, well, that, let's just leave, poly, you know, leave teaching out of this. But uh, citizenship. Citizenship means that, that you participate in a, in a, in a helpful way uh, with those around you. You know, we talk about voting. We talk about obedience to the law. We talk about paying our taxes. We talk about all the things that make us a healthy citizen that m uh, we as individuals help the, the, the country that we live in or the community that we live in, we as an individual help the, the community be better because we're better, okay? If everybody in a community is better, then the whole community is better, right? That's what he's talking about here in this scripture, in this citizenship that we have in the kingdom of God, the family of God. If we treated everyone in our community as a family, uh, in, in the right way, of course. Uh, you know, we, we know there are dysfunctional families. We're, we're not talking about those. We're, we're talking about a family in the way a family should respond, in a family that helps each other when they're down, shares in joys, shares in laughter, shares in sorrows, uh, supports one another when we need some help. All of those types of, of uh, uh, communal type things that we, we do as a family or as a community. He says, that's the way you are to act in the body of Christ. In this, this family of God, uh, this is the way that you are uh, to, to act. That you are to be a good citizen and to participate in the household, okay? In the household, you're, you know, uh, pick up your own dirty socks, okay? If you dirty a dish, wash it, okay? Take out the trash once in a while. You know, that, that's, that's, that's a, a physical thing that we talk about in, in a household, but in the body of Christ, you know, sometimes there, there are, there are, there's a job that needs to be done that somebody ought to do. We've talked about that. Somebody ought to do it. Well, you're somebody. I know I'm somebody because God don't make no trash, does he? That's right. So we are somebody. We should be doing what God has blessed us. We should be participating in the family of God in a positive way. And by doing that, we're going to draw others and we're going to welcome others into that family. It says, uh, we are of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So what do we use as our um, uh, instruction when we're building this house of God? What do we use? We use the apostles. Paul himself was writing some of this instruction to us. The other apostles, uh, you know, the, the gospels, we see the, the, the other letters from Jude and John and all of those. Those are instructions that give us uh, details on how to build this family, the love that we should have for one another, the help that we should offer to one another, the life that we should live that pleases God according to all that. And he says, everything is based on the person of Jesus Christ. He is the, the chief cornerstone. He is the, the um, uh, fixture that is there that everything else is based upon. If, if somebody asks you to do something and it doesn't line up with Jesus Christ and his teaching, then it's not of the household of God. But if, if somebody uh, instructs you or you are felt prompted to do something and it lines up with, with what Christ would do, then you are in the process of building up. 
Okay, it says, because in whom, talking about Jesus, in whom all building fitly joined, I'm sorry, fitly framed together, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. The scriptures tell us that we, our body is the temple of the, of the Holy Spirit, right? That, that God lives in us when we accept him into our life. That we are um, a, the temple of God. But then we also, as we are joined together, we become the church of God. And so just mathematically speaking, if, if, if uh, I am uh, the temple of God as an individual, if there are lots of me and we are unified together, then that whole entity becomes the dwelling place of God. That is the temple of God. And so that, that is why both myself as an individual and the church body are all the dwelling place of the Most High God. And, and knowing that, that gives us, that should give us both a, a somberness to, to make sure that we are doing things right, but also a joy in the fact that, that the, the creator of this universe, the, the all-powerful, all-knowing, uh, all-healing God is desires to have a relationship with me and live where I am. It says, uh, uh, in verse 22, it says, In whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. That the, the Spirit is going to bring us unity. Christ is bringing us peace. And with all of those things, if we are doing those things right, and we are um, living this new life in Christ, because of Christ and as using Christ as our example, the Spirit is going to lead us into a, a, a pathway that's going to allow us to be the habitation. We're going to be the dwelling place of the Most High God. And that's, that seems contradictory, that we should want to go live where He is, but right now He wants to live where we are. And, and that, that uh, relationship is pretty incredible when you think about it. So if we're going to live with him for eternity, we need to accept him to live with us where we are today and live a life, a new life, according to his, his word and his direction. So God bless you and live a new life. Be, be at peace through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.